Welcome to the very first Power to the People webinar. Tonight's webinar, The Power to the People and the Courts, will be a review of recent United States Supreme Court decisions, cases, from the prior term. We are delighted to be kicking off this seven-part webinar series on Constitution Day, which commemorates the signing of the Constitution 233 years ago. My name is Mark Gage. I'm Director of Publishing for the Center for Civic Education, and I'll be serving as the facilitator of this event. The webinar will last about an hour and a half until 9 p.m. Eastern. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll get to as many as possible. You can also put them in the chat. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. And now I'd like to say a word of thanks to our sponsors. Our first sponsor is the Center for Civic Education. We're also sponsored by Kansas State University and the Johnson County First Amendment Foundation. Our next sponsor is the Indiana Bar Foundation. Thank you so much sponsors. Without you, this event would not be possible. And now our, moderator, our moderators for tonight are Robert S. Lemming. Director of the We the People programs for the Center for Civic Education, and Thomas Fonts, Director of the Center for Social Studies Education at Kansas State University. Our scholars tonight, our first scholar is uh, Judge, U.S. District Judge May Avila D'Agostino. Uh, Judge D'Agostino is the United States District Judge for the Northern District of New York. She is a magna cum laude graduate of Siena College in Loudonville, New York. After graduating from college, she attended Syracuse University College of Law, receiving her Juris Doctor degree. At Syracuse, she was awarded the International Academy of Trial Lawyers Award for distinguished achievement in the art and science of advocacy. Judge D'Agostino was the first woman on the federal bench in Albany, and upon her nomination was called one of the most well-respected attorneys and successful courtroom practitioners in the Capital Region by the paper of record, The Times Union. She was unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate in March 2011. And our next scholar, Christopher Ariano is the present president of the Center for Civic Education, the nation's largest constitutional law and civic education nonprofit dedicated to promoting an enlightened and responsible citizenry, both in America and around the globe. Christopher also serves as a lecturer in constitutional law and government at Columbia University, where he teaches comparative jurisprudence, constitutional theory, and the fundamentals of government. His book, Marriage Equality, From Outlaws to In-Laws, co-authored with Professor William Eskridge, is the definitive history of marriage of the marriage equality debate in the United States and has been praised by reviewers as beautifully and access accessibly written and essential work. It was published by Yale University Press in August 2020. Welcome to everyone. I hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Christopher R. Riano. Christopher. Thanks so much, Mark. I'm really excited to have everybody here. I'm especially excited to have a chance to talk to everybody on Constitution Day. I know everybody has been working very hard because it is Constitution Day and it's my first Constitution Day as the president for the nation's Center for Civic Education. So I am so very excited to be here today. And I wanna kick off by truly encouraging everybody to participate in tonight's discussion. We're prepared some of the cases from this last Supreme Court term. But this is much more exciting and fun when we have a chance to be interactive, especially when some of that interactivity has been missing as we all deal with the current pandemic. So I certainly encourage people to ask questions, make comments, have us think about various things that you want us to think about. I know that we are going to try our best and I know that others are gonna try their best to make sure that we can see your questions, especially as we move forward in our presentation. And I would be remiss if I actually didn't start the evening off with a question for everybody who's joined us tonight, because I'm actually quite curious. I was looking and looked at a little bit of history before we turn over to our cases. 
And I'm curious to know if anybody who's watching tonight knows which United States federal court is commonly known as the mother court. So if you have an idea or you have a thought on that, definitely feel free to type it into the chat. I'm gonna keep an eye on that because this is a pretty important historical point that I wanna start off with tonight because I think it actually helps ground something really incredible that I saw today when I was preparing. So I like that. That's a great question or a great, great uh, guess. Somebody's guessed the Supreme Court. I appreciate that guess. Miss Michelle Lee has guessed the Southern District of New York. And that's part of what I'm going to talk about in just a moment. That's a very, very good guess. Does anybody else have any guesses besides the United States Supreme Court from Seda and Michelle? The Ninth Circuit, Sarah, I love that guess. I will tell you, I am sure that the Ninth Circuit wishes that they were known as the mother court. Um, the DC Circuit, the Fifth Circuit, the DC Circuit, I like how that's come up twice. That's actually a very, very good guess. The Fifth Circuit, uh, down in the southern part of the United States. Uh, the circuit courts actually came in, into existence after the district courts, but those are good guesses. District court, DC circuit, this DC district. So this is great. I love this. I'm going to tell everybody why I started with this. It was Tuesday, September 24th of 1789. And this was the summer as the Congress was beginning to look at the way the structure of the United States would look, that the district court, the district court of New York became in, in existence. And it was Judge James Duane, who was actually the 44th mayor of the city of New York and the first post-colonial mayor of the city of New York, was nominated and confirmed on September 25th, 1789. I'm curious if anybody here knows what else happened on September 25th of 1789 that is of relevance to today. So what else happened on September 25th of 1789 that is very relevant to the day we celebrate today? The drafting, I said, good, that's good. I like that, good. That's very, very good part of the drafting, and there's something very particular about the drafting of the Constitution that happened today. Published, oh, that's a good one. Constitution, that, that actually is very close. Aha, Katie, Katie, you are circling, circling Amy, the Bill of Rights, good, 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 good. So the Bill of Rights began as a concept immediately following the adoption of the Constitution. The Bill of Rights commonly is seen as beginning of kind of its journey on June 8th of 1789. And does anybody know how many original bill, uh, bills in the original amendments passed the House of Representatives? Does anybody know how many? Everybody's guessing 12, 11, 12, 12, 12, 11, 10. This is good. This is exactly what I'm doing. This is, these guesses are so good. 20, good, these are good, very, very good. So it was August 24th, 1789, that 17 passed the House. Now, let me be very clear when I say that. Everybody's not wrong when they say 12, because it was September 9th that 12 passed the Senate, and it was September 25th, 1789, that the 12 amendments that passed were sent to the states. Same day that Judge Duane took his seat uh, and was confirmed for the District of New York. And why am I celebrating that and talking about that from the beginning? Well, it was known as the District of New York until the District of New York in 1806, or excuse me, uh, until the District of New York was split in 1814 between the Southern District and the Northern District. And it was actually Judge Talmadge who was seated on the District of New York who was the senior judge who came to be the first judge of the Northern District. And we are in a Northern District courtroom this evening. So there is a healthy competition between the Northern and Southern Districts about which court is the true mother court because of the senior judge being a Northern District judge uh, when that was split with, by Congress. And I note that specifically because I think it's important to remember that even as the federal courts became into existence, 
the Bill of Rights did not even exist. I think that's an incredible thing to constantly be thinking about as we go over some of the cases that we're gonna discuss this evening. And I specifically wanna mention that because in so many ways, we're gonna be talking about some constitutional concepts, we're gonna be discussing some statutory concepts, some of the big questions that have come up in this particular term. And I encourage people, like I said, to ask questions about that. But I think it helps set the tone of why today is so important. We often, whether we're students, teachers, professors, scholars, anybody who studies the Constitution, think about that time sometimes in a very compressed way. And I think it's an incredibly powerful thing to start tonight off by reminding ourselves that in those years that the Constitution came to look the way that we think about it today, those, in those years, the way the Constitution came to be think about how we think about it today, that it was not a static period. It was not a particular time. Amendments happened. Judges were, uh, courts were being created. Judges were being confirmed. It is an incredible thing to think about that period. And that's the period I think that we really celebrate when we celebrate the Constitution. Now, I'm sure that everybody knows that it was actually not the First Amendment that we think of today that was proposed as the First Amendment in those 17, 12, and then 10 ratified amendments. It was actually the Third Amendment that has now it was ratified as the First Amendment. And so with that, and I think part of that history that makes this so incredible, I wanna turn our first cases over to the judge because we have two really interesting First Amendment cases that came out of this last term. And I think that's a great place for us to kick off and start so that we can have a chance to think about right from the get-go how important that amendment is even today. So with that, Judge, I will turn over these cases to you. Thank you, Professor Riano, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I have to tell you that civics education of every kind is a passion of mine. And since I've been on the bench, and even before I was on the bench, uh, I've been totally devoted to trying to teach uh, children, teachers, anyone who will listen, um, about our court system because I certainly have a great reverence for it. So much so that when my son was 16 years old and I was talking to him about what I did as a trial lawyer, I was getting myself choked up about it. And my son looked at me and he said, mom, you're not normal. And you know, I, I really couldn't disagree with him very much on that, but I have a, a great reverence for our court system. I don't think it's a utopian court system. I know we have our problems, but I think it is really the best in the world. And I'm always trying to convey that through the educational programs that we have here at the federal courthouse in Albany. We are actually tonight in the courtroom that I use for all of my civil and criminal trials and all of my proceedings. And this is the very courtroom that we often, when we are not in pandemic, pandemic circumstances, have children and teachers coming through to carefully have lessons on civil cases, criminal cases, uh, law day, constitution day. So this is a subject that means a lot to me. I feel it's a privilege to be able to speak tonight and I begin with this statement. I know the title of the program, but I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'm a trial lawyer, and I'm a trial lawyer and now a judge who works very carefully to know what the current law is and to apply the law to the facts as I get them, both here in the courtroom and on motion. I will also tell you that I've lectured many times before. I've had the privilege of lecturing with Professor Riano and he's often jumping in. So if you see his face jumping in and out of the frame, that's because he thinks that he has something to say that's important and everything that he says is important. And I'll never know when he's coming up from <laughs> behind me. Sometimes I may swat him, other times I may just let him go right ahead because uh, he really is um, the constitutional scholar. My goal tonight is to talk to you about a few scintillating cases. The first two cases are cases 
involving the First Amendment. And then I have the very interesting McGirt case that I will talk to you about uh, a little bit later. If you ask me a question and I don't know the answer, I won't hesitate to tell you that. If you ask me a question or I get a question that I feel that I can't answer because a matter like that could come before me, I will tell you that also. But my cases are interesting and I hope that you find them interesting too. The first case is Little Sisters of the Poor that was decided uh, just in July of this year, more particularly July 8th of 2020. Uh, the opinion was written by Justice Thomas and Chief Justice Roberts, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh all concurred. Uh, Justice Alito concurred writing a separate opinion with which Judge Gorsuch joined in. Judges Kagan and Breyer concurred. Justice Kagan wrote um, a decision which Justice Breyer joined in. And there was a dissenting opinion by Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor. This is a very interesting case. And we have to remember that it comes in the context of a case that you probably all know, Little Sis, uh, Hobby Lobby. Uh, the Hobby Lobby case, which came before Little Sisters of the Poor, stands for the proposition that government should not substantially burden religious exercise. So we start at that premise that government should not substantially burden religious exercise. And then we take a look at the case, uh, Little Sisters of the Poor. In that case, uh, the issue presented was whether the government created lawful exemptions from a regulatory requirement implementing the Patient Protections and Affordable Care Act of 2010. And I'm just going to call it for purposes tonight, the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, when you say those words, uh, most people react in a very visceral way. It's been a hotly contested act. There have pe been people who have great disdain for the act. There are people who have supported the law. But in this particular case, there were more problems with the law once it was promulgated and more exceptions to the law, which brought us to this Supreme Court case. Under the Affordable Care Act, women were said to be able to have access to preventative care and screening. Now the act itself didn't describe what that preventative care and screening stood for, but other agencies such as the Health Resources and Services Administration uh, had guidelines in terms of what women should be entitled to through the act. And part of what they should be entitled to was federally approved contraceptive care. Well, no sooner was that decision made known, did certain organizations begin complaining about the mandate, saying in essence, we have sincerely held religious beliefs and you cannot make us provide to women employees contraceptive care, period, end of story. So the agency began a series of what they called IFRs or interim final rules and trying to get this act in, in a form that would be acceptable to many constituencies became very, very daunting. In fact, Justice Thomas, at the very beginning of his decision, states, after six years of protracted litigation, uh, and, and it really was protracted, the Departments of Health and Human Services, Labor, and the Treasury Department, which jointly administer the relevant ACA provisions, exempted certain employers who have religious and conscientious objections from this agency created mandate. So 
the agency tried numerous times to carve out exemptions. At the heart of this case, however, is the issue as to whether the agency had the right to carve out religious exemptions. No one doubts that they had the right to describe what preventative care meant, and no one really disputes that they had the right to include that contraception for women should be a part of the plan, but it's been hotly contested, or it was hotly contested, as to whether the agency had the authority to make these exemptions. The Third Circuit ruled that the departments lacked statutory authority to promulgate these exemptions. The Supreme Court ruled that this holding was clearly erroneous. They said that the departments had the authority to provide exemptions from the regulatory contraceptive requirements for employees for individuals who had religious and conscientious objections. But that was not the first exception. There were more. In February of 2012, the departments promulgated rules that temporarily prevented the guidelines from applying to religious nonprofits. And then in 2013, another final rule came about, uh, which the, the agency said was simplifying things. And the agency said that we're going to simplify the, the definition of a religious employer and the exception so that if you don't feel that you want to provide contraception, the exceptions will include one, organizations that oppose providing contraception on account of religious objections, two, that are organized and operated as nonprofit agencies holding themselves out, three, holding themselves out as religious organizations, and four, and this is an important one, self-certifying that they meet the three previous criteria. Now came along the Little Sisters of the Poor. Quoting from Justice uh, Thomas, they, the sisters, feel called by their faith to care for their elderly residents regardless of faith, finances, or frailty. The Little Sisters endeavor to treat all residents as if they were Jesus Christ himself, cared for as family and treated with dignity until God calls them to his home. Consistent with their Catholic faith, and this may surprise someone what their objection was, but consistent with their Catholic faith, the Little Sisters hold the religious conviction that deliberately avoiding reproduction through medical means is immoral. Here's the most interesting part. They challenge the self-certification accommodations. So again, the agency is saying, look, we're going to carve out an extension for you. We understand, we understand Hobby Lobby. So all we're asking is that you self-certify that you qualify. So the Little Sisters of the Poor challenged the self-certification accommodation, claiming that com just by completing the certification form would force them to violate their religious beliefs, quote, by taking actions that directly cause others to provide contraception or appear to participate in the department's delivery scheme. So all of the hard work done by um, the agency to try to carve a workable exception out was now in question. So the Supreme Court ruled that, first of all, the departments had the authority to promulgate the exceptions. And then they moved on to the question as to whether uh, the rules were procedurally invalid. In, in looking at the validity of the rules, they took a look at all of the things that the department did to promulgate the rules. And they satisfied themselves and they say in the decision 
that the department complied with all of the statutory procedures. They requested and encouraged public comment. Um, they put the rules out in a concise statement. Um, they, they made their intentions very clear. They gave the public enough time to comment. They said, the, the Supreme Court says in sum, the rules fully complied with the maximum procedural requirements that Congress was willing to have the courts impose upon the agencies. So ultimately, in taking a look at the carved out exemptions and spending a lot of time on whether or not these exemptions were valid, the court ultimately held that yes, they could be carved out and in this case, the Little Sisters of the Poor, um, you know, did have a, a valid objection to signing the certification. And ultimately, in a, um, I don't want to call it emotional, but um, in, a, in the final pages of uh, the decision, Justice Thomas writes, for over 150 years, the Little Sisters have engaged in faithful service and sacrifice motivated by a religious calling to surrender all for the sake of their brother. They commit to constantly living out a witness that proclaims the unique, inviolable dignity of every person, particularly those whom others regard as weak and worthless. But for the past seven years, they, like many other religious objectors who have participated in, the, in this litigation and rulemaking leading up to, 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 yeah, pardon me, to, to today's decision, have had to fight for the ability to continue in their noble work without violating their sincerely held religious beliefs. After two decisions from this court and multiple failed regulatory attempts, the federal government has arrived at a solution that exempts the Little Sisters from the source of their complicity-based concerns, the administratively imposed contraceptive mandate. We hold today that the departments had the statutory authority to craft the exemptions, as well as the contemporaneously issued moral exemption. We further hold that the rules promulgating these exemptions are free from procedural defects. So the circuit was reversed. There was a, a robust dissent. Um, in the dissent, uh, Justice Ginsburg and Sotomayor state, today for the first time, the court casts totally aside countervailing rights and interests in its zeal to secure religious rights to the ninth degree. Um, this case may not be finished yet because Judge Kagan, although she concurred um, and joined in with Justice Breyer, wrote words to suggest that what was done this time around may be overbroad and Justice Kagan uses the words perhaps arbitrary and capricious and uh, she indicated that a careful agency would have weighed anew um, the benefits of exempting more employers from the mandate against the harms of depriving more women of contraception. So I'm not positive we've seen um, the end of this. Again, in the dissent, uh, there is language that states that the destructive of the Women's Health Amendment, this court leaves women workers to fend for themselves to seek contraceptive coverage from sources other their, than their employers, insurers, and absent another available source of funding. So, it's an interesting case. As I said, I'm not positive it's finished. Um, and it right now is the law of the land and the religious exemptions exist. Many people feel that these are extraordinarily burdensome 
um, terrible decisions for women who are seeking to have contraceptives paid for by their employer and insurance companies. And others feel that consistent with Hobby Lobby, um, anything less than this would present uh, an undue burden uh, to the religious organizations. Did you want to say anything? Uh, you've been very sedate here, Professor <laughs> Rihanna. I will, I'm trying to watch and carefully monitor any questions that have come up. And I'm seeing people talking about some of the questions about how this looks. I just want to note one thing that I think is really critical. The religious freedom portion of the First Amendment is a really extraordinary part of not just the historical place that the First Amendment comes from, but even today, the way that we look at what is codified as some of the most important and critical rights we have. Let's not forget, I mentioned before, the First Amendment was not intended to be first, but over time, I believe if you really think about it, as Americans, we have really gravitated towards the importance of number one. First among equals, but critically important. And I know that as teachers, we frequently hear people talk about their rights of free speech, free expression, their right to assembly and to petition. So I just wanna note that I think it is critical to think about at all times we talk about the religious and the freedom of religion in the First Amendment, that it is a very unique part of the Constitution. It certainly isn't a settled part of the Constitution. And the other thing that I want to note that the judge, that was so smart to note, I didn't even think about it, I was writing my notes on it. There are a lot of cases that we will see like this that deal with the Administrative Procedures Act and questions about the big case, I think we probably all know the Chevron case, questions about the arbitrary and capricious nature of administrative decision-making. And so I strongly encourage when we think about cases under the APA, cases that deal with the Administrative Procedures Act, that we constantly come back to, how does this look from a deference perspective? What type of review are we looking at? And how does this look from a constitutional kind of universe? Well, I mean, and that's that you hit the nail on the head because, um, you know, the circuit court was saying that you can't do this to the Affordable Care Act. You cannot keep carving out these exemptions. You do not have the authority to do that. That was at the heart of it. Yeah, exactly. And and I see questions about, you know, exemption damage, the AC. I, I again, I, I come down to I, I trying to think about answering these questions in the time that we have and thinking about how important this is. There's a very unique deference that's given to administrative decision making. And the APA is a critical piece of especially the last, I'd say 50 years of American constitutionalism and the way in which the administrative state has almost become in many instances what we call the fourth branch of government, right? And I know we've all taught that at some point or another or heard of that if we're students or, and think about, well, what in the world does that mean? And that's a longer discussion. But I think in many ways, that's how I would answer some of those questions that are coming up because that makes this special and makes any case that deals with the Administrative Procedures Act special. And yes, Joe, uh, Joseph, in many ways, the federal bureaucracy, but it, I, I think that's a, it's a good way to put it, but it can actually be a little bit more because there's also administrative agencies at state level and places like New York City most certainly have them at the city level. So as do many municipalities. With that, I'll hand it back to the judge so that she can continue as right. she looks at her cases. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to go on to, uh, because I know time is going to go very quickly here, um, the second case that I uh, reviewed, which is uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, decided on July 8th, 2020, Justice Alito delivered the opinion of the court, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, Thomas, Breyer, Kagan, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh concurred. Uh, Justice Thomas filed a concurring opinion joined by Justice Gorsuch and uh, Justice Sotomayor dissented, joined by um, Justice Ginsburg. Uh, again, I, I think um, a fascinating case. And 
just as I talked about Hobby Lobby as a premise for Little Sisters of the Poor, uh, before I talk about Our Lady of Guadalupe, I will just make reference to the case of Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church against the EEOC, which was decided in um, 2012. And um, in that case, the court adopted what we call a ministerial exception and indicated that judicial review of the way in which religious schools discharge their responsibilities would undermine the independence of religious institutions in a way that the First Amendment does not tolerate. I don't often go to the dissent before I go to the decision, but I will just say that uh, this case involves two teachers who lost their jobs at religious schools. One teacher claimed that she was fired because she was old. The other teacher claimed that she was fired because she had cancer and had to undergo cancer treatment. When you, I will get to the dissent, but um, the dissent seems full of despair and basically says between the lines and, and not so between the lines that good luck if you work for uh, a religious educational institution because you probably don't have any rights at all. And I, that's not commentary on my part. You'll see that when I get to um, the dissent. Uh, the two teachers involved, two separate schools, and I want to talk about the individual teachers, and then I want to compare and contrast that just for a moment um, with the Hosanna case. So in uh, the Guadalupe case, teacher number one was somebody named Morrissey Beiru, and she did teach at Our Lady of Guadalupe. She taught fifth and sixth grade, she, and all subjects, as, as is often the case in Catholic schools. I am a product of a Catholic elementary school. Should also add that I was the product of a number of uh, double grades, which I could go over with you with a bottle of wine, but basically first and second grades put together. When the teacher was teaching first grade, we, the second graders would be told to take a nap and vice versa. Anyway, uh, Miss. Morrissey Beirut taught all subjects. She was required to teach religion. Um, she was required to take some religious classes when she got the job at the school's request. She was expected to attend faculty prayer services. She was to develop um, by the school handbook, a Catholic school faith community. The handbook uh, that she signed indicated that hiring and firing was guided by the Catholic mission. She was required to participate in liturgical events. She was considered a catechist, a catechist, but not a minister. Keep that in mind. Uh, she was expected to prepare students for mass and confession. Uh, she was expected to teach students Catholic values. Uh, one year they changed her work status from full-time to part-time. Um, the next year they terminated her. Uh, she did say that she believed she was terminated uh, for a younger teacher due to age discrimination. The school said that she was terminated because she did not do well with their new reading and writing programs. Uh, summary judgment uh, was granted uh, to the school, but this was reversed by the Ninth Circuit. There was another teacher at another school, St. Agnes, Kristen Beal. She was a long-term substitute who then became a full-time fifth grade teacher. She was expected to attend religious events at the school. She was required to teach religion um, and to incorporate uh, the faith in everything that she taught. She was required to prepare students to attend mass. She was required to pray with her students. 
and uh, her contract was not renewed. She believes because she had breast cancer and had to be out of the building for treatment, uh, they said, the school said that that had nothing to do with the decision and they had valid reasons for her termination. The duties and most importantly, the title of these teachers was compared very carefully in the decision uh, with the previous decision in the Hosanna case. The teacher in the Hosanna case, Mrs. Parrott, was actually called a minister. And the Guadalupe case has several pages talking about um, the role of faith in uh, England, the title that was given to ministers, uh, the fact that religion was an integral part of uh, the British way of life. And that is picked up on very carefully by the dissent in this case, because the dissent continuously says the teachers in the Guadalupe case were far from ministers of anything. And if, if you've read the decisions, you've seen that minister appears on nearly every page of the case. But in the majority opinion, they keep saying, not so fast. Don't get hung up on the fact that in Hosanna, uh, we tailored our decision and said that we were going to carve out a ministerial exception because the majority found that these teachers, although not granted minister status, uh, probably were granted ecclesiastical status, whatever that is, but they also found that they did and were required by their contracts, by their agreements, to do many prayerful things, whether it be praying with the faculty, praying at mass, preparing um, the students to go to mass, uh, incorporating um, the concept of Jesus Christ into as many teachings as they possibly could. And therefore, the majority said, it, it doesn't matter that these teachers are not ministers. We are holding for purposes of this decision that they are entitled to the same um, kind of deference as we gave the teacher in the Hosanna case, and that we are not going to uh, second guess these religious schools. We're not going to micromanage these uh, religious schools. And in essence, we're not going to inter interfere with the decisions that uh, these schools are making. And so there was no relief for either teacher the dissent, quite unhappy, um, written by Justice Sotomayor, as I indicated, joined in uh, with Justice Ginsburg. Uh, it begins, two employers fired their employees allegedly because one had breast cancer and the other was elderly. In the court's view, because the employees taught short religion modules at Catholic elementary schools, they were ministers of the Catholic faith and thus could be fired for any reason, whether religious or non-religious, benign or bigoted, without legal recourse. Justice Sotomayor distinguishes uh, Perrick, uh, the teacher in Hosanna, and over and over says she, she was a minister, uh, she was formally commissioned as a minister, and you can't paint the two teachers in this case with that brush. Justice Sotomayor says we are clearly not ministers. Uh, Justice Sotomayor concludes that the majority conclusion portends great consequences. She adds, thousands of Catholic teachers may lose employment law protections because of this outcome. This sweeping result is profoundly unfair. 
it permits a religious school to discriminate with impunity. And overall, in the dissent in this case and in the dissent of Little Sisters of the Poor, I think is a concern that on the one hand, the majority in these cases, they feel that for many years, the pendulum uh, swung in a manner that was unfair to religious organizations and that it had swung way too far. The dissents now are saying the pendulum, you were worried about the pendulum swinging too far against churches and religious organizations. Well, now the pendulum is swinging violently in the other direction to remove certain rights and privileges that people should have, whether it be a woman seeking to have an employer or a third party insurance company pay for contraception, or in this case, to be able to get in front of a jury your reasonable belief that you were fired because you had to leave for your chemotherapy treatments or because of your advanced age. And I, I feel I failed to say the obvious, which was that the older teacher was replaced uh, with a younger teacher. So, I mean, these cases are extremely interesting cases. They, um, the lines are drawn uh, very clearly between the majority and the dissenting opinions. And um, there's more to come because the Fulton case will be argued this coming term at the uh, United States Supreme Court involving um, uh, whether or not adoption agencies that have sincerely held religious beliefs can have certain practices with respect to whom they will adopt uh, out children to. So more is to come, okay? And I, I will tell you that I, I, I'm not as talented to be able to get through my lecture and to read um, the comments at the same time, and I apologize, but I know that Professor Riano would jump in if he felt necessary. I have one more case, but that will be a little bit later. Thank you. Judge, thank you so much. And I, you know, I am watching the questions, and I do want to note, you know, one of the questions I see that I think is really important to address right, right from the get-go is the question of how you balance constitutional amendments. And that's not an easy thing to do because I mentioned before, the First Amendment is first. We now as Americans very much gravitate towards our First Amendment rights. But I see the question that Michelle has posed to asks about the 14th Amendment. And I think we can all agree the 14th Amendment is absolutely critical in so many ways when it comes to the way that this country looked after the Civil War and the way in which the Constitution was amended after the Civil War to apply, especially the Bill of Rights and other parts that, uh, uh, of the Constitution that applied to the federal government to the states through the process of incorporation. I do wanna note a few things before I turn to one of my cases. Um, I think that it's, you know, the first two cases obviously do deal with the First Amendment and questions of uh, the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, these questions are not answered. Um, and there's a lot of discussion that will always surround the questions that arise under the First Amendment because of how important the First Amendment is in our constitutional lexicon at this point. But I do want to say something that I'm going to bring up from the book I just finished. There has to be a way to find compromise and balance. I think it is difficult to say, well, which amendment wins out, the first or the 14th? And I know that the justices on the court do try their best to try to think through how the balance looks and how it applies specifically to the facts of the case before them. That's always something I found interesting. One of the first things I ask my students and the first things I ask people that talk to me about constitutional cases or any Supreme Court cases is, well, did you read the case, right? Don't look at the headlines, look at what they wrote. Look at what they wrote in the uh, controlling opinion, concurring opinions and the dissent. And that I think helps get us to where we wanna be. And as I mentioned, I talk about this in the, uh, my book, it's important to think about balance. It's important to think about the way in which religion has to balance with 
uh, questions of statutes that are passed or questions of other pieces of legislation that are passed. And I actually um, want to come down and now talk about one of the cases that I have, which is the Bostic case. Now, this is a hugely important case, and it is not a constitutional case. It is a statutory case. So I think that is very unique, and I want to start off by noting that. And I'm going to ask a question, and I hope everybody can chime in in the chat box. I'm going to see how well everybody does. Does anybody know what year and in what case the United States Supreme Court ruled that you cannot criminalize people for LGBTQ conduct? Does anybody know what year the Supreme Court ruled that you cannot criminalize LGBTQ conduct? Oh, this is, I love these guesses because it, it's, it's so impressive. Yes, yes, good. Lawrence v. Texas, 2003. Why do I note that from the beginning? It's 2003. So that's not even 20 years ago that the Supreme Court decided in Lawrence v. Texas that particular question. Because it's only 2020 today, right? Let me ask a second question before I get to Bostick. What year did the Supreme Court rule that marriage equality had to be allowed and you had to be allowed to marry a person of your choosing, regardless of gender or sex, across the United States? What year? Two thousand oh, Burger Fell, so we're doing better. 2015, oh, Burger Fell, five years ago. Now let me ask this. In the vast majority of the United States, until when was it possible to fire somebody for being married to somebody of the same gender on, sat on Sunday and then coming into work on Monday. Katie's got it. Katie, I'm sure that you got that correct because I'm sure it was in one of your students' videos today that I know everybody was watching and celebrating. So that's correct. That was just on June 15th of 2020. I want to note that at the outset because I think sometimes we forget how incredibly unique these cases can be, important these cases can be, impactful these cases can be, and actually current these cases can be, because that was only a few months ago. Now, I want to start off by noting what this case is about. I'm going to ask another interesting question to see if anybody can tell me. So this case dealt with employment discrimination rights under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was passed as part of the package of civil rights acts that have been passed for many, many decades. And that particular part of the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination on the basis and because of sex. Now, the court ruled in a 6-3 decision under Justice Gorsuch, or by uh, opinion by Justice Gorsuch, that an employer who fires somebody for merely being gay or transgender because of their sex violates Title VII. Similarly, any other employment action that somebody could take, not hiring somebody, for example, would violate Title VII. Now, it again left open some questions that could arise under the First Amendment. And I want to note that because the, the decision of the court and the six justices that decided this was very explicit that there could be questions that come up under religious exemptions. And I want to see if anybody can get this right. Does anybody know what this case did when it came out the morning that it came out at the US Supreme Court? And I, I have never seen this happen, at least since I checked Supreme Court opinions. The morning this came out, does anybody know what happened at the Supreme Court the very moment that they tried to issue this opinion? I'll be really shocked, but I'd be so impressed with guesses. Oh, I like that, that's good, okay. <laughs> no, so any other guesses before I tell everybody? The server crashed, yes. That's exactly what happened. So because of the dissent, and I don't mean the way it's written, I want to be very clear, because of the number of attachments that were actually put into Justice Alito's dissenting opinion, the server crashed, which I've never seen happen. And so, of course, as the court has been remote, everybody was logging on to try to get the opinions. 
Um, there's a very interesting thing that some Supreme Court practitioners do. We all get excited at 10 in the morning and get on our computers and see the opinions get posted live every 10 minutes and the server crash. So it took an extra amount of time. Nobody could load the opinion and everybody was actually emailing and chatting and texting about it. It was a really incredible moment to say the least because we all know the opinion came out but none of us could read it or have it load. I note that because I think that shows how incredibly critical this opinion is because there's that many people that were interested in this holding. Now, I wanna talk mostly about what ramifications I think this opinion has when it comes to what happens moving forward for the American public. Now, this opinion does not just apply to lesbians and gay men when it comes to Zarda or Bostic, and it doesn't just apply to transgender individuals like the Stevens, uh, Plaintiff Stevens, but it also, I think, will start to apply to other sexual and other gender minorities. Now, what do I mean by that? People who are intersex, which has become a, uh, something that's more prevalent and seen uh, post Obergefell, um, individuals with different biological or possibly both male and female bi biological markers. All of these people, I think I would argue, and um, others would argue, probably now enjoy job protections because the opinion was actually written in a very conservative way. And I don't mean that in a political way. I mean that in the way that the opinion looks at how to interpret the word because of sex and how to interpret looking at discrimination based specifically on somebody's sex. Now, I, I wanna kind of think about that broadly again because non-binary persons are likely most uh, protected now. Gender non-conforming persons are now probably protected. So I think in many, many ways, this case has broader ramifications than it even looks like on its surface. Because by having a conservative look at a textual approach at how to look at because of sex has broad ramifications when it comes to looking at how this is likely to protect the LGBTQ community uh, in a large sense. Now, I also want to note a few other things. There are other sex discrimination laws that are similar and have similar language to Title VII. And I think that many of those are now going to see some changes based on this particular opinion. The big one people ask about all the time is Title IX, right, which conditions federal funds uh, for education for non-discrimination based on sex. Um, questions under the Affordable Care Act, I believe, will come up. Um, and I think what this case does is it really fasts forward a lot of those arguments from a textual standpoint of what the Civil Rights Act really protects when it comes to the LGBTQ community. Somebody's asked a question about equal protection. Well, I think it's always important to think about cases where we find them, but also think about how this looks broadly. This case is a statutory interpretation case. So it's not constitutional. It's not looking at what does due process require in the Fifth Amendment when it comes to the federal government or due process require when it comes to the state governments in the 14th Amendment. And it doesn't really look at equal protection the same way either under the 14th Amendment. But let me add this. While this is a statutory case, I don't think you can remove ourselves from the way in which the constitutional questions continue to be presented broadly. And I would refer back actually to the Obergefell case when it comes to that particular question. And why I say this, because if you look at the way in which the Obergefell court analyzed marriage equality, they did it through the lens of the Liberty Clause and substantive due process. Now, yes, there is an equal protection argument in there. There are equal protection questions that Justice Kennedy adds there because of the majority of, uh, of justices. But it's less constitutional. And when the court can think about a statutory way to approach things, and that's the real argument, the court's going to look at the statute because that was congressional and Congress's intent. And this actually goes to my third point before I want to end and turn back to Judge D'Agostino. This is a statutory ruling, but it definitely has constitutional echoes. The Supreme Court has long looked at the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment when it comes to sex discrimination and scrutiny. And this is why, Bill, I like the question that you just posed. The court has never said what level of scrutiny can, should apply to uh, minor, sexual and gender minorities. Now, it's talked about the way in which we should look at scrutiny when it comes to sex, but not when it comes to the LGBTQ community the same way. 
After Bostic, it's arguable to say that a heightened scrutiny now must apply. Not necessarily clear, but there's a good argument to be made. And as such, you can see states like Utah and North Carolina that have been moving away from some of their uh, anti-transgender initiatives even before Bostic, I think even more of those are going to become problematic post Bostic because of the way this case looks. I will close with this particular point. Um, when it comes to the bigger picture of how this looks, what's really incredible is that this was something that's been on the decks of Congress for decades. Um, the Equality Act has been on the decks in Congress for many, many, many decades. Is introduced actually, if I remember correctly, by Representative Bella, Bella Abzug of New York and later Mayor, but at that point Representative Ed Koch of New York. So you can see how long this has been in the making that would have made this more explicit. So Bostic is an interesting way in which the, the term is now being interpreted. Uh, so instead of congressional action, the courts have, and the Supreme Court has moved, that does not mean that con Congress will not necessarily act. And Katie, very quickly, would you say it's intermediate scrutiny or strict at this point with Bostic? I think in many ways that is part of the question. The levels of scrutiny in the equal protection analysis are really unique. Why do I say that? Well, the equal protection clause has its genesis actually in Ohio. And in the Ohio Constitution of the 18, I believe 50s, if I, I may have that decade wrong, but in the 18, I know it's the 1800s. And if you look at the way in which the Equal Protection Clause was debated, there's a lot less about and really nothing about the levels of scrutiny and much more about what that clause meant. And I think that that actually helps to inform in many ways this continual interplay between due process and equal protection. 19, 1851, thank you. So I was at least in the right decade. That's good because I'm not always great with dates. But I would say this, those levels of scrutiny are still not clear. I, I referred to it as a heightened scrutiny. That's probably as far as I would want to go because it has not necessarily been determined. But with that, I think it's important to be conscious that this is now a, a, a point that has been litigated, will continue to be litigated, but constitutionally is unclear. I say that with the note that Bostic is an absolutely critical, critical case. It's very well written. It's probably one of Justice Gorsuch's with the exception of the case that Judge D'Agostino is gonna talk about, probably one of his seminal cases at this point um, because of just how well it is both written and also what he says in it. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to the judge um, so that she can continue on her next case and we can stick to time. I promise to leave you time. No, please, Judge. We're having fun. With all the questions, I can tell. Okay. The, <laughs> the McGirt case, McGirt versus Oklahoma, 140, Supreme Court, 2452, uh, decided on July 9th, 2020. Uh, I have to start with a little history lesson uh, for this case. Um, about 180 years ago, uh, a group of indigenous Native Americans known as the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole lived um, as nations throughout the American Deep South as they had uh, for hundreds of years before. As the United States grew, those in power decided that it was necessary to relocate the Native Americans from their ancestral lands. This was called by the powers that be uh, an Indian problem. And to remedy the so-called Indian problem, the federal government imposed a forced relocation plan to remove the Native Americans from the Deep South. This plan was first championed by none other than George Washington, and it evolved and was codified in American law by President Andrew Jackson when he successfully pushed the Indian Removal Act of 1830 through Congress. It was the Indian Removal Act of 1830 that authorized the government to extinguish all Indian title to deep South lands and to fully remove the Native Americans. To uh, quote, peacefully execute this plan, 
the federal government made a promise to the five civilized tribes that if they agreed to remove themselves voluntarily, they would forever be granted replacement land out in the great American West. One of the five tribes who accepted the government's offer was the Creek Nation. That nearly 200 year old promise is the backdrop for the issues in the McGirt case. The opening paragraph uh, of the McGirt case uh, written by Justice Gorsuch is really something that is better to listen to, I think, than to read. He writes, on the far end of the trail of te tears was a promise. Forced to leave their ancestral lands in Georgia and Alabama, the Creek Nation received assurances that their new lands in the West would be secure forever. In exchange for ceding all their land east of the Mississippi River, the US government agreed by treaty that the Creek country west of the Mississippi shall be solemnly guaranteed to the Creek Indians. Today, we are asked whether the land these treaties promised remains an Indian reservation for the purposes of federal criminal law. Because Congress has not said otherwise, we hold the government to its word. That is masterful. This case involves something called the Major Crimes Act. And uh, men, some people are not readily familiar with it, but the Major Crimes Act provides that within the Indian country and any Indian who commits certain enumerated offenses shall be subject to the same law and penalties as all other persons committing any of those offenses within the exclusive jurisdiction of the United States. Now, in this case, a defendant by the name of Jimmy McGirt uh, was tried in an Oklahoma state court and convicted for molesting, raping, and sodomizing a child. The court, uh, through, just, through the majority opinion, uh, maintains that Jimmy McGirt committed this albeit despicable crime in the Indian country. And as such, it was not allowed that he be prosecuted by the state of Oklahoma. I, you know, after reading this case about 10 times, I kept calling it the what reservation case because Justice Gorsuch spends the majority opinion giving all the reasons why this land, and this is massive, this is a massive amount of land that encompasses the city of Tulsa, is a Native American reservation to this date. He says a promise was made and a promise has to be kept. And much of the majority decision is talking about all of the things that Congress did subsequently to try to disestablish this land as a reservation. And Justice Gorsuch maintains continuously in the um, majority opinion that there's nothing that Oklahoma did, but more importantly, there's nothing that Congress did that in any way changes the fact that these Native Americans were promised that if they left, if they left their ancestral lands, this would never be taken away from them. And he basically says um, in the decision, not basically, he says, while there can be no question that Congress established a reservation for the Creek Nation, it's equally clear that Congress has since broken more than a few of its promises to the tribe. And he says that, that these, these broken promises, these attempts to sell off the land, individual parcels to other Native Americans, 
uh, to other people, that, that doesn't disestablish the tribe. Um, he says you can, uh, there att the attempt for Oklahoma to try to assert their own rules, their own procedural rules, their own legal rules, that does not disestablish the tribal lands. And Justice Gorsuch maintains throughout that this is tribal land, this defendant committed this horrendous crime on this tribal land, and that the only place that he should have been tried and can be tried is in a federal court as opposed to the state. Quickly, I'm just going to say that the dissent written by Justice Kavanaugh, uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts was not happy about this. And, and Justice Roberts spends uh, the, the dissent essentially arguing that there is no reservation. Uh, there are no tribal lands. Um, he states uh, that McGirt was sentenced to a thousand years plus life in prison. Today, the court, the majority holds that Oklahoma lacked jurisdiction to prosecute McGirt on the improbable ground that unbeknownst to anyone for the past century, a huge swath of Oklahoma is actually a Creek Indian reservation on which the state may not prosecute serious crimes committed by Indians uh, like McGirt. So um, Justice Roberts goes through painstakingly, painstaking detail to demonstrate that while Congress may never have passed a law or a resolution saying we take it back, we, we know we told you, you could live there, you could have a reservation, but we take it back. Chief Justice Roberts said that Congress um, did many things to disestablish this reservation. They did so by land allotment. Um, they did so after the Civil War and uh, when they passed certain regulations regarding um, the Creek Nation. And um, there's a lot of concern about what this decision might mean in the future, because there are thousands and thousands of people uh, learning, I guess, for the first time that they're living on a Native American reservation. And um, Justice Roberts says, what has gone unquestioned for a century remains true today. A huge portion of Oklahoma is not a Creek Indian reservation. Concerns that have cropped up in the literature include um, things such as, are the, uh, is the Creek Nation going to begin imposing taxes and levies on the individuals uh, living uh, within what is now considered to be um, the Creek Nation? Um, are uh, federal prosecutors um, go, are state prosecutors going to totally have to stop prosecuting? Justice Gorsuch says no, because the Major Crimes Act only includes very limited crimes. So Justice Gorsuch says, be calm, stay calm. Um, all of the terrible things that you say are going to happen are probably not going to happen, but it, the uh, the dissent is very, very concerned about where this may all uh, lead that part of the country to. And ultimately, and I'll, I'll stop so that Professor Riano has some time, Justice Roberts says, applied properly, our precedents demonstrate that Congress disestablished any reservation possessed by the Creek Nation through a relentless series of statutes leading up to Oklahoma statehood. Uh, this, is to be uh, this story is to be continued. Uh, it's, if, if you haven't read the entire decision, I recommend it to you. It's very interesting and very well written. Thank you. So I did see a few questions and I'm gonna try to address them as best as I can and make sure that I do leave a few minutes for other questions that may come up. And I do want to talk about the two Trump cases from the term. I, I see a lot of questions about constitutional supremacy, treaty ratification, 
Um, will this apply in other instances? How does this all fit? I want to add something that I think is quite interesting. And I'm not sure if everybody knows about this, but the way in which the court has interpreted, and this was actually just decided once again last year, the federal versus state governments, the court and tradition has looked at them as dual sovereigns. Now, why do I say that? Well, we're talking about criminal law and the power of a state to exercise criminal authority versus the federal government to exercise criminal authority. We're talking about how that operates in a criminal context. I think that's very important because I want to zoom out a little bit, slightly, from this question of treaty ratification, treaty status, uh, you know, the concept where treaties exist with sovereign nations when it comes to Native Americans is very much tied to a portion of, I believe, Article I, Section 8. But even more than just that, more than just that, I think the key pieces here are, again, that this is dealing with state criminal authority vis-a-vis -vis successive acts of Congress, right? Successive acts that Congress took when it came to Oklahoma. And there's no question in my mind that just like the judge mentioned, this case has legs. This case does and will continue to have a pretty incredible impact. It's why I mentioned it uh, as one of the two cases I think that really are beginning to stand out when it comes to Justice Gorsuch and his jurisprudence. Now, that actually dovetails very well into something that I want to open with as I do quickly discuss Trump v. Mazars and Trump v. Vance. I know we talk about this all the time, but I want to reframe once again how important this is, right? The branches of government and the layers of government are critical to think about and remember when we are discussing cases, constitutional, statutory, any of them. And why is that? Because the obviously Congress in Article One is the place where the most authority of the federal government is intended to reside, right? And with the courts in Article 3 and the executive in Article 2, it's important to note where they fall and the way in which that was looked at, not just when the Constitution was drafted, when it was ratified, but the way it's been interpreted for over 200 years. Also, the layers of government are critical. I know we spend tons of time discussing the federal government, but again, I always know it is your local government, your local representatives that have by far the most impact in your life, generally speaking, for the vast majority of people because they deal with water, sewage, trash, things that really can have a vast impact on your day-to-day -day life. Why do I bring that up? Because I think that's actually very important to think about when it comes to understanding both of these cases. These cases are different. They are critically different. They are very, very, very different. Even if the decisions, even if the way the decisions look and the votes of the decisions are both seven to two. Now in Mazars, the issue is whether congressional subpoenas seeking financial information that deal with the president as a private citizen, as a private citizen, um, implicate questions of executive privilege and implicate other separations of power issues. Now, we know traditionally that Article III does not, and Article III courts try to avoid separation of power issues between Article I, the first branch of government, Article II, the second branch of government. And Chief Justice Roberts in Mazars wrote a majority opinion, seven to two, that while executive privilege doesn't perfectly fit the mold when it comes to these particular congressional subpoenas, the court below, and it was the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, did not really look at the uh, account and the significant separations of powers issues that existed based on the subpoenas that came from the House seeking the president's personal financial records. Now, I, I wanna read actually a quote that comes from the opinion because I think this helps put this into context. The standards proposed by the president and the solicitor general if they were applied outside the context of privilege information would risk seriously impeding Congress when it comes to Congress's responsibility to carry out its job. And of course, it's Congress's responsibility to legislate. That's where Congress has the most authority. 
Far from accounting for separation of power concerns, the House's approach aggravates them by leaving essentially no limits on the congressional power to subpoena the president's personal records. Any personal paper possessed by the president could potentially relate to a conceivable subject of legislation, for Congress has broad legislative powers that touch a vast number of subjects. In many ways, I would read this to note that the record below and the way that Congress issued the subpoenas doesn't necessarily fill out enough for the Supreme Court to really understand whether this uh, relates to more of a separation of powers issue between Article I and Article II, or the way in which Congress went about actually issuing these particular subpoenas. Now, obviously, executive privilege exists and is designed to safeguard presidential decision making. How that fits with personal financial records is another question. But the president does not have blanket immunity from records requests. And executive pri the privilege should not be transplanted root and branch to cases involving non-privileged private information. Now, the chief judge or justice outlines a couple different things for the lower court when it was remanded to consider, including questions like whether the legislative request warrants the involvement of the president, if others can possibly give Congress similar information in its responsibility to legislate, whether the subpoena is too broad, does it cover too much, does it get at the heart of what Congress is attempting to legislate? and looking at their legislative objective. The nature of the evidence that's requested by the subpoena, does that advance a valid legislative purpose? And how much of a burden does it place on the president? Now, this case has been remanded. It is being looked at in, uh, further. But I think it's an incredibly interesting case when it comes to political questions, political question doctrine, and separation of powers. Again, I think it's important to note we don't emphasize this enough. Article one is the first article in the Constitution. There's an incredible amount of authority that is vested specifically in Congress. So I think that's something we have to consider when we think of this case and we think of congressionally involved cases because it is Congress where the Constitution vests in, in the first article, the majority of uh, federal authority. Now, this is very different and I've had this come up with students, very, very different than Trump v. Vance. And it may seem nuanced. I would argue it actually is not. Now, in this case, it's about subpoenas, but it's about a county prosecutor looking to issue a subpoena and has issued a subpoena to a third party custodian when it comes to financial and tax records. Now, again, the Chief Justice issues and rights for this majority in a 7 2 opinion. Um, holding that Article Two and the Supremacy Clause don't categorically preclude or require any sort of heightened standard for the issuance of a state criminal subpoena to a sitting president, and very specifically that no citizen, not even the president, is categorically above the common duty to produce evidence when called upon in a criminal proceeding. Now, I want to say something about that. Chief Justice Roberts, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, all look at this and they write, citing back to Chief Justice Marshall, where there is an established principle that is 200 years uh, in the making and has been established for 200 years that no citizen, including the President of the United States, can escape the common duty to produce evidence when called upon in a criminal proceedings. In our judicial system, the public has a right to every man's evidence, and every man's evidence since the earliest days of the Republic, and every man has included the President of the United States. Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Gorsuch write a concurring opinion. They come back to a case, it's pretty well known, United States versus Nixon, that talks about a demonstrated specific need for this subpoena. And they said, while they unanimously agree that this needs to be remanded, there's a question of standard. Standard is important, but I think what's more critical is the fact that seven justices noted and came back to the same concept that no member of the federal government, no elected official is above the law. And Justice Thomas and Justice Alito wrote separate dissents, very much focused on the use of the president's time and the importance of the executive branch. I don't think that those are arguments that should necessarily be ignored. I think they're actually in many ways encapsulated in what the Chief Justice writes 
to look at this balance when uh, remanded. And in fact, this has now been remanded and is back percolating through the courts here in New York. Um, and I think this case, as many of the cases we've discussed, will be a continual question that uh, will come up. And I'm looking at, we have five minutes left, so I definitely want to make sure that I answer any questions that I've missed. Joseph asks about no one being above the law in the Vance case. Yes, I mean, they're talking specifically about the presidency, but they're citing to a common principle established by Chief Justice John Marshall that no citizen can escape the common duty to produce evidence when called upon in a criminal proceeding. I would almost say it dovetails with the way that you've outlined and put that, but I also wanna note that the simplistic nature of saying that no one's above the law, and that's a great quote, necessarily likely has more nuances. And so I think that as always, the specifics and the facts in a particular case matter and matter deeply. And Joe has asked something about civil suits that aren't related to executive duties. Now this case is looking at a state criminal subpoena. This comes up all the time and I remember this from private practice. Civil law, civil lawsuits, criminal law, criminal subpoena, vastly different in the way that the law approaches them. Now, Joe, you've correctly noted in Clinton v. Jones that we're looking at executive duties, civil lawsuits related to those executive duties. That is different than a criminal subpoena issued by a criminal prosecutor. And the law will look at those through two different lenses, but uniquely enough, the thing that often circles around when it comes to the second branch is the incredible amount of time that the executive branch and the authority that's vested in the executive branch, the incredible amount of time that, that is expected to be delivered by that particular individual in that office. And that's why Justice Thomas and Justice Alito focus very much on that and the burden that could cause if there are thousands of elected prosecutors and local prosecutors who suddenly start subpoenaing the second branch of government. So in many ways, I think that's why there's a separation there. That's why civil and criminal are very different, but it's why it's important to think through those specific facts in the specific cases. I note that there are three minutes left. And so I wanna make sure that if there's anything else that people wanna ask, Tom, do you have something? Yes, I do. Can, can we go back to a little, uh, first of all, this was great. Uh, you know, Supreme Court cases are outstanding resources for teachers. They're controversial, they involve real people, and they're oftentimes, we're looking for endpoints in for in our constitutional system of government. And you both did it uh, an incredibly great job of doing it in, in a kind of a nonpartisan way, which is superb. But going back to Little Sisters of the Poor, this whole idea of administrative decision making, you know, it permeates uh, all levels of government, right? I mean, even our attorney general, just what was it yesterday or the day before was kind of throwing, uh, you know, prosecutors uh, under the bus and, and the lower that yada yada. It happens at my university. We make policy and uh, somehow that policy gets um, messed with as it's interpreted by the bureaucracy. So what are the legal limits of administrative decision making? Do we have clear legal limits from state or federal courts about where, where we draw the lines for the bureaucracy, for lack of a better term? I mean, I have a good, Judge, do you wanna go ahead? I was gonna say, um, no, there are not clear lines necessarily. The idea is that an administrative agency is supposed to be an expert in their field and that the administrative agency should be able to regulate within that field better because they are experts in that field. So yes, there is a Chevron concept under the Chevron doctrine and there is a deference that exists when it comes to courts questioning the fourth branch of government when it comes to the arbitrary and capricious nature of rulemaking and questions that come up under rulemaking. So just very, very briefly, I don't think that that line is necessarily clear, nor could it be clear, because in many ways, the way that the law looks is the, that the third branch of government is supposed to take somewhat of a hands-off approach. I know something important that is not necessarily what Justice Gorsuch thinks. And I think that's important to note because there's not necessarily a long-term view of how Chevron deference may look. And so that is a more fluid area of law, and that's why I come back to that. Uh, Tom, is because 
there's different opinions on how much authority administrative agencies should have, federal, state, and local level. I, would, I agree with uh, Professor Riano. I think that, first of all, you look at the Enabling Act, and that's the interesting thing about uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor case, because the ACA neither provides for what kind of care women are supposed to get. There's not a word in the Affordable Care Act about contraceptive care or preventative care. Um, and that's interesting. And there's not a word in the ACA about exemptions. So I don't think that there is a lot, that there is a clear pathway right now in terms of what is acceptable regulation. And we begin by looking at the Empowering Act, but in this case, it's really silent. And uh, ultimately, the majority says, we're, we're willing to accept that um, the regulators can decide what type of care should be allowable, such as contraception. That's fine. And we're also saying that they have an absolute right uh, to make exemptions. And you, and you have to look at that case in the, in the light of the fact that I mean, six years went by and they didn't seem, the agencies didn't seem to be able to satisfy anyone. And the first time Little Sisters of the Poor went to the Supreme Court, they sent it back with a directive, work this out, get, get, get together and, and, and fix the language here so that you don't infringe upon religious rights. So the court, in my view, the court invited um, you know, the agency to promulgate uh, additional rules. And that's when they came with what they thought was the clear cut test, meet these three requirements, self certify that you meet the three requirements and you're good, but that didn't do it. I don't know if that answers your question, but it is a, a wide open area right now. Perfect, uh, thank you uh, so much. Wonderful, and I think Mark and Bob, I'm sure about to jump in. Before you do, I just wanna thank everybody, I guess live from New York right now, right? <laughs> live from New York. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. It was really an incredible opportunity. The judge and I have done this before. We could do this for another four hours probably, but everybody I know is, it's nine o'clock here. I know it's, you know, everyone's joining us from around the country. So thank you, so appreciate this. And Mark and Bob and Tom, Feel free to close everything out. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this evening. I it gave me a great opportunity to uh, brush up on these cases that I read earlier this year. And thank you, uh, Professor Liano, for inviting me and all of you for inviting me too. Well, thank you so much, uh, Judge D'Agostino and Christopher. Uh, this has been great. And I just wanted to um, mention our uh, our sponsors, once again, the Center for Civic Education, Kansas State University, the Johnson County First Amendment Foundation, and the Indiana Bar Foundation. Thank you so much. We cannot do this without you and without our wonderful scholars.